Hi. Um, it's nice to be here. That was my joke. <laughs> it's nice to be here. Um, right. <laughs> there you go. Um, so my name's Joe. Um, I'm part of a collective called Assemble. Um, today, I'm going to try and talk a little bit about Assemble, but also how we work. Um, this is something that we get asked all the time. Um, so I'm going to try and answer some of the most common questions, things like, how do you work collectively? Um, is anyone in charge? Um, how on earth do you make decisions? Um, and then the one that everyone always asks is, how do you get paid? Um, so maybe if we start with the basics, um, who are we? Um, so Assemble is a collective of around 15. Um, some people say 18, some people say 15, I don't know. Um, but we work across lots of different disciplines, so from architecture to art, design, construction. And I guess we enjoy working in a way that kind of blurs the line between these different fields, um, where our role, the title of our role, is really flexible, depending on the situation that we're in. Um, there's lots of us who studied architecture, so that's kind of our background, but then there's also people in the group who have got a background in philosophy, history, and English. So there's lots of different frames of reference happening in Assemble. Um, and that's what I think makes, makes a lot of our work really varied. Um, so at the moment, we're currently designing architecture like this. So this is a new art gallery that we're doing for Goldsmiths University. Um, we're self-building workspace like this. So this is Yard House. This is next to our studio in East London, which we built ourselves, designed, and we run. Um, we're making businesses like this. So this is a Black Horse workshop. It's essentially a library for tools in Walthamstow. Um, we're running events like this. So this is a project we did down in Croydon, in New Addington, um, looking at making new public space. We do exhibitions. So this is exhibition design we did at the Royal, uh, Royal Institute of British Architects with Simon Terrell, which is all about brutalist playgrounds um, and aversion to risk. Um, and then sometimes we make furniture like this which is, I guess, a little bit unorthodox, but you know, we're amateurs in that way. So, um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit, it's like, how did we start? We started with this project. So this is a project called the Cinerolium, which we did in 2010. Um, so it happened six years ago. Um, most of us had finished university studying architecture, and we were working uh, in various practices on our part one, like year out. So you do three years at university, you do a year out, and then you go back. And I guess we were kind of a bit bored with working in stuff. We wanted to do a, a project that was a bit more holistic, where we could be involved in every different thing. So like conceiving it, building it, finding the site, finding the funding, running it, and then taking it down. Um, so there's this kind of collective urge, is what we're saying, a collective urge to build something. Um, so we set about the task of trying to find a site, trying to find some money. Um, this is us in someone's front room, you know, trying to work it out in our kind of spare time after work. We were looking for a petrol station. So we'd read about these petrol stations, which were closing every year all over the UK. And we, we were kind of fascinated with them as a typology, these kind of stilts with this little hat on top. Um, so we wanted to find one. We were like, let's do a project in that. Um, it was the time of the economic crash, kind of 2010, so developments were stalling all over the place. So finding one was actually really easy. We found this one on Clerkenwell Road, and we spoke to the guys who owned it, the developers that owned it, who were trying to do something, and they were like, we ain't doing anything with this. So they were like, you know, you can have it, like six weeks, eight weeks, whatever, just have it, we're not going to do anything. So each member kind of put 50 pounds in, and we applied for a little arts grant, so about 2,000 pounds art award, and that was our budget. So we're running on a budget of about 4,000 pounds, and we were like, let's do something. So we thought about doing a cinema in this space. And so I guess resourcefulness was really important to us. Um, we didn't have any money, but we did have lots of hands. Um, so we looked at you know, trying to make old furniture from the petrol station, using that to make jigs. Um, we kind of had production lines, found materials, got sponsorship, found donations of materials, and a theme kind of developed, I guess, out of necessity rather than anything else. That was the thing that was driving it. Um, we loved these old cinemas that existed, you know, all the pictures of them with their kind of amazing materials and this kind of um, 
I guess there's a romance in all of this. So we tried to recreate it on the cheap. Um, so we were using things like Tyvek. So this is a roofing material that you don't normally see, and that became the kind of festoon curtain. We were looking at things like scaffold boards, it's kind of the cheapest wood you can get, um, and looking at making cinema seats with that, you know, making the sign ourselves. We, we got gifted some Formica, so we started doing some marketry with that to make different bits of furniture. And we even made, we, you know, we tried to make our own vacuum former to try and make some, some, some tiles for the roof, which actually terrible. Um, but, you know, it's like the joy is there, you know, made the whole costumes and stuff. So, you know, it was really, it was really a kind of, um, what do you say, labour of love or something. So from making the costumes, programming the films, to running the bar, making the ice cream. Um, and then we kind of, you know, we made up different ways that people could get involved from the street. So we did these drawings like this about how to make a cinema seat from a scaffold board. Um, so people could come and join in for a day or two days or a week if they didn't get fed up of us and make this stuff. And then this is the end of it. So this is what it was like when it opened. Um, this is the inside, so you can see. We were talking to the cinema museum at the time, and they gifted us these kind of amazing vintage velvet cinema seats, which we kind of scattered between our ad hoc <laughs> scaffoldy splinter on your bum type seats. Um, but that was the inside. And the whole thing, I mean, the idea was the whole thing was a kind of performance. So at the end of each thing, there'd be a kind of cast of 12 people who would stand around the outside of this thing, and you'd be sitting inside this thing right on the Clerkenwell Road with the kind of sound of cars whizzing past. And then, end of the film, it's like, whoop, up the curtain comes, and you find yourself on the street. <laughs> um, and, and I guess that's it, you know. Um, that was, that was what kind of, that's what kind of formed us as a collective. Um, you know, we learned a lot from this. The idea of, um, I guess, like collective, collective learning, like no one really being in charge. The idea that, you know, something can happen if you get a group of people together. It might not be what you originally thought it was going to be, but it will be something. And I guess that's, you know, that's really important. So, how do you work collectively? Um, so the Cinerolium was really important in establishing an environment of mutual support and collective learning, as I was saying. But we had to, I guess, after that project, we have to try and find a way that we could work with other people, so we could work with clients and stuff. So when I was prepping this talk, I was, I was looking at collectives and I was thinking, you know, how do other people do it? You know, what are their systems? Because we've designed a system which we work in. So I looked at these guys, so the Wu-Tang. I mean, I'm a big fan of the Wu-Tang. So they're like one of the most influential hip-hop collectives ever. They've got seven gold and platinum albums. Um, and they're a collective. There's about nine of them. So these are the guys. Um, they formed around this kind of self-initiated, self-funded project. So it was a single called Protect Your Neck. Um, I don't know if you know it. Um, but I think they're origin... I mean, like, I think Assemble and the Wu-Tang, you know, could be the same kind of thing. Um, <laughs> so after their kind of initial underground success, um, they landed a record deal, Enter the Wu-Tang 36 Chambers. I mean, it's amazing. Um, and that deal enabled individuals. It was a very unique deal. It meant that all the individuals within the Wu-Tang could remain self-employed, so they could do projects elsewhere, um, but they could still be part of this collective with Hatch the Record Deal. So if you look at the Wu-Tang and how they work, <laughs> so this is it. You've got people like Ghostface Killer, who's doing his own stuff, Method Man, um, Inspector Deck. So they're all they're, they're kind of collectively working together for this thing, but they're also doing their own stuff. And I guess, you know, that creates a kind of amazing output. Like, these guys are incredible. They set up, like, Wu Wear, which is like a clothing line. They set up a kind of PlayStation game where they are making their own controllers and stuff. I mean, some of them have become film stars, you know, working alongside people like Bill Murray. And, and now, so in December 2015, they became artists where they sold their newest album for $2 million, one album, one copy, to an art collector. So, you know, assemble. That's basically the Wu-Tang. So this is us. <laughs> this is how we work. So you can see we're kind of all in it as a group, but different people have different involvements. So lots of people teach. Everyone's all, everyone, well, almost everyone's got different other commitments. Um, and everyone works as a kind of freelancer. Um, so people can work as much as they want. Some people run record labels. Some people run construction companies. Other people teach. Most people teach. Um, so, you know, it feels like a good way of, um, of I guess, 
meaning that everyone is kind of, you know, interdependent, but then they're still part of this group. Because Assemble kind of helps in the same way that Wu-Tang Clan. I mean, that helps to bring work forward. So, is anyone in charge? No, they're not. So this is a, this is a hilarious illustration someone did, which I always love. So this is us, and we run completely flat hierarchy. So no one's in charge. Um, which is, I guess, you know, lots of people think that's crazy, and so they say, like, how do you make decisions? How do you do stuff? Um, so we created a number of office roles. So these are roles that we decided collectively would, would, would be important. I'm not sure if the Wu-Tang do this, maybe. Um, but there's like a HR person. There's someone who does the kind of housekeeping. So they look after the studio. And then there's a kind of finance admin guy, which, which is really important. So they're kind of working five days a week. Um, so when a project comes in, there's an email that will go to info at Assemble Studio. And the HR person will read it, wait for the week for all these things to come in. And at the end of the week, send out a weekly digest, which is, which is one of the most interesting emails. I'm joking. No, no one ever reads it. But um, so that comes out. <laughs> no, that comes out. That comes out. All the members read it, and then they keenly respond to the ones that they want to do. So it goes back to HR. And then they choose two people. They choose buddies. So that's how we run it. So there has to be two buddies who want to do a project for it to happen. So if a project comes in to build like a new housing estate for Tesco or something, and I'm like, yeah, that's for me, guys. You know, and no one else wants to do it, it doesn't happen. But if two people want to do it, and no one really objects, I mean, that's going to go through. So they make a proposal, which comes to our Monday morning meeting, every Monday, which everyone who's running a job has to attend. And then, if it's accepted, it goes to the client. If they accept it, then it becomes, that becomes the project. Um, so this is how it works. So you've got the buddies running the job, or running the kind of face of the job. You need someone to answer the emails to the client, basically. A client gets freaked out if you have 50 meetings and it's a different person every time. They're like, <laughs> you know, what's going on? So there's a, they're, they're, in, they're in charge of that, the email stuff. And then there's kind of working groups which work around it. And then every week we have design reviews. So every Monday morning I say there's an update. And every Monday evening we all have a big dinner together. Everyone who's working elsewhere, everyone who's teaching, they have to come back, and then we review the projects. So your project might get reviewed every two weeks, every three weeks, but it gets reviewed. So how do you get paid? So we're, remember, we're in the Wu-Tang freelance system, but any money that comes in, 50% goes to assemble. That's done. So that means that pays for overheads, rent, insurance, facilities, support for pitches. So there's work, you know, like when we started, where it's like, I've heard of this thing, you know, we'd really like to do this stuff, or I'd really like to, you know, build this club. And if people agree, then Assemblers, the company's got enough money to kind of pay for someone to do that. And then it pays the office roles. The other money goes to wages, so the project buddies can kind of do with that as they, as they kind of see fit. Um, so they could just pay all of themselves, or they could pay it to the different people, or they could just pay someone else to do all of the work. Um, and I guess, you know, is it any good? I don't know. I mean, it, this is something... This is something that we've been working on. You know, we've been going for about six years now. We put this in place. I mean, it's going. Um, <laughs> I mean, there's massive debate. You know, we have, you know, people try, it's like tax evasion. It happens on a mini scale within the office where they're like, yeah, 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 but this project's really cool, so maybe we'll only pay 40% or 30% tax or 20% tax to us. So it's, you know, it's a constant debate. And we had a, we had a kind of hilarious summit recently where we all went up to Stirling. So this is the gang, <laughs> where we rented one of these big landmark trucks properties, and we all stayed there and had this kind of three-day, like, arduous debate about assembly. It's like, what is assemble? <laughs> like, that's, that's a day gone. It's like, you know, <laughs> how many people are in assemble? That's day two. And then by the end, it's like, you know, is this the right system? So that's how we're working at the moment. I mean, I, I hope it's a bit enlightening. Um, but I guess that, you know, the, the point of this is that, you know, we wanted, to work with, we wanted to work with other people. We wanted to work with clients. So I'm going to talk a little bit about a job that um, I've worked a lot on in Liverpool. Um, so Liverpool, so it's a port city in northwest England. I don't know how much people do it. But, I mean, for centuries it received loads of immigration um, from all over the world. Um, and Granby, the area we were working in, was in the south of Liverpool. Um, it's one of the areas in the city where kind of international community thrived, a real diverse neighbourhood, 
um, in a city which actually is quite divided in terms of this stuff. Um, but it was a really thriving place. You know, these are photos from the 50s, 60s, like full of shops, loads of people having loads of fun on the street. <laughs> um, but then in the kind of 70s, 80s, the area really suffered. Um, so it's like post-industrial economic decline in Liverpool. I mean, this happened in, in, in lots of northern cities. Massive unemployment, kind of mistrust from local government about this area. And then eventually there was these, there was these kind of terrible uprisings against the kind of racist police force, institutionalised racism, really. So these were riots that happened in 1981. These were the worst riots the UK's ever seen. The first... Oh, no. Like, worst riots England's ever seen. It's the first time the army's ever been brought out in England. I, got, I did a lecture in... Glasgow the other week, um, and I got told off because it happened in Scotland or something. But um, <laughs> in England, in England. Um, so, you know, for the local authorities, this became seen as a really, you know, really problematic area. Um, so over the subsequent 20 years, there was a kind of succession of top-down regeneration schemes which sought to demolish the houses in the area and start again, kind of displacing people and kind of, dis you know, the idea is displace their problems as well. Um, but people in the area kind of consistently fought against this. Um, and they saw it as a kind of another victimization of the area and the community that had already suffered so much. Um, so people in the area valued things that the authority didn't. I mean, they valued the buildings which spoke of this kind of history, this amazing history, you know, where it used to be a wealthy place, where it used to be this, this place that people wanted to live. Um, and so while there were small victories, um, the kind of plans carried on. So this is a map of what Granby looked like in 1950 with these rows of terrace houses, and this is what it looks like today with this kind of misguided scattering of crap <laughs> which is kind of happening in the north as they kind of slowly, systematically demolished all of this stuff. Um, and so this kind of went on until 2011 when the government kind of finally kind of said, you know, like, we're going to stop this. And so there was only kind of four streets left. So I'll show you some photos. I mean, this is what it was like. So they moved everyone out of the area. All the, all the, all the stuff was boarded up. And they replaced it with this. And then you got another street. So it's 2008, you know, moved everyone out of the area, replaced it with this. And then another one. I mean, I like this one. So this is, this is you know, you know, could you imagine a place like this in London? I mean, it'd be, it's, like, it's like ridiculous that this, there'd be this like, kind of amazing housing stock that no one was using. Um, it was a place like this, and if that wasn't bad enough, a couple of years later, they did this. Um, so of the four streets that were left, they're, they're kind of just sitting in this, in this place where lots of people have been moved out, um, and no one really knew what to do with them. So there's areas, there's different areas in Liverpool that are like this, streets upon streets. And I guess... You know, what's, what's, kind of, what's kind of crazy is that within these streets, there, there were some people still living. So if you bought your house in the 80s or if you bought your house in the 70s, you know, they could move the council tenants out. They could move the housing association tenants out or force the housing associations to do it. But if you bought it, they couldn't move you out. Um, they could get a compulsory purchase order. But, you know, they didn't want... With these last four streets, you know, they wanted to push people out, but the people couldn't sell because your home's not worth anything. Um, and they kind of admit this, you know, they say, you know, we left the streets like war zones. Um, but amazingly, so the group that we were working with are people that lived within these four streets. Um, and they kind of took it upon themselves to do something about it. And it's quite, you know, it can be quite, it's quite a strange demographic because it's generally people who bought in the 70s, 80s. So it's like, you know, retired Women is kind of what, what most of the people were. And so they took the domestic activities that, that, that you know, they'd known in the house and they started painting these empty shops, empty houses, to try and make the place a little bit more bearable. Um, there's some ama these are some amazing photos. So don't, don't knock this one down either. Don't bump into this one. So this is when people are coming over demolishing houses. You know? And they, you know, the one thing they really had, their one kind of weapon was, was, was gardening. Um, that's the one thing they knew. And they took the opportunity that no one cared about them, no one collected their bins, no one like, even really knew they were there, to try and enhance some of the public space around them, which meant that they were making streetscapes like this, 
which are kind of, you know, there might be only two or three people living on the street, but they're full of more life than you'll find in, like, a fully occupied street in London. Um, they set up a street market, which looked to try and use or, like, replace some of the functions that the high street, which didn't exist anymore, um, could do. And, I mean, this is one I went to last week, and it's thriving now. Um, and so this was, all stuff, this was all stuff they did. This was all stuff that they were doing. And we really came along. We kind of joined their battle three years ago, um, where we just we kind of listened to what they had to say. And with the, there was a social investor who had heard about their story, who got in contact with us and was like, you know, you know, do you want to work? Do you want to work in this area? And we just tried to, I guess, give kind of validation to the stuff that was already there and say, like, you know, there's all this amazing stuff. We should look at a new way of developing this area that wasn't just about blanket demolition and rebuilding, but it's like maybe it could be much more piecemeal and make a much more interesting city where house by house is given to a different developer. So the CLT, they formed a community land trust, which is like a group which means that you can receive, it's a vehicle to receive housing, um, which can then remain in the community's ownership. So, so you know, it's not, it's not going to be something that they're going to sell. And so we worked with them to look at um, some designs for these houses and what could be done to make them to make, them, um, to make them livable again. So we were looking at using some of the opportunities that exist in these houses, so the fact that floors have fallen in and roofs have fallen off or whatever, um, to try and use that a, a kind of in an economic means to try and make a space because it's like, well, we might as well make it double height so we don't have to rebuild the floor. Um, so the houses are in terrible condition. I mean, lots of them have been burnt. Um, it's like people had thrown fireworks through the, the streets or whatever. I mean, that first image, the Robbie Fowler, was from a house that I walked into, and it was the season of 1990. And I walked in there in 2012. So no one had lived in that house for 22 years. Um, but, you know, they got the houses off the council, which was great. Um, they kind of believed our spiel. Um, and so then we were looking at redoing them. So we are doing very, very simple things, you know. We had to work with local builders, um, on a very, very cheap budget. So we had to use stuff that they were used to, like plastering and you know, normal floorboards and stuff. But as I was saying, we looked for opportunities to make interesting space. So where the ceiling had fallen down, we made a room where it was vaulted. You know, it's simple things like that. And then in some of the houses where they were in really, really bad condition, we made a proposal to make a winter garden. So this is going to be a community garden. So this just got funding from the Arts Council. Um, so this is going to be a community garden in a house. Um, the idea is that it's kind of, you know, it's a way of making permanent the stuff that the local residents were doing on the streets for so many years. So very simple housing. I mean, we use things like paint. <laughs> paint. <laughs> it's cheap. <laughs> Different colours. Um, you know, <laughs> normal floorboards, but like whitewashed, so they don't look that kind of piney yellow. We tried to open up the space, you know, because these things, they're terribly dark, these houses. Everything's white with these colours. Um, and then we, you know, we look to make these kind of special elements, I guess, as a way of zuzhing up, you know, enriching what was already there, um, what was, you know, quite a simple thing. So we made these tiles, like bespoke little bathroom tiles, which would be made on 150 by 150 white, like the kind of cheapest things that you can get, but just applying decals and stuff. And then we made, we made things like fireplaces which was from the rubble, and then, and then things like doorknobs. And I guess, you know, this is where we, like, duck and dive, in a way. So we were offered an uh, opportunity to do an exhibition called Build Your Own. I guess we're the, we're the, like, DIYers, the professional amateurs. You know, that's kind of how we started. And so the Crafts Council wanted to do an exhibition called Build Your Own. And we were like, yeah, you know, we've got a really good idea. We'd like to make some mantelpieces for these houses. And so they bought into it. So we kind of set up a workshop in the back of one of the houses, and we went through the skips and found rubble, bits of brick, different things, and then used that as a way of making these different, these different mantelpieces which went in the houses. So this was the exhibition. This is one in Eleanor's house. So Eleanor's lived on the street in Cairn Street, one of the four streets for like 25 years. So it was kind of a gift, gift to her of one of these mantelpieces. And while we were doing that, you know, we were living there in this house on the street, upstairs, the kind of contractors were living down, not living, but I mean, their office was downstairs, so it was kind of community cafe in the one room. And, you know, it was kind of amazing, this like production, this stuff that was being made to go in the houses was happening on the street. Um, and that's, you know, that's something that's really cool, I think. 
So I guess, you know, growing out of this work, you know, from the start of the project, there'd always been an interest in how the process of rebuilding houses could start to support the rebuilding of a kind of local community, a social infrastructure with kind of economic opportunities offered to the people, people living in the area. So growing out of this work, we set up this thing called Granby Workshop. Um, so this is a business which was based on the high street in one of the corner shops. Um, and the idea is that it would train and employ local people to make some of these products that we'd made for the houses. Um, and I guess partly in response to this kind of outright surprise of being nominated for the Turner Prize, um, I guess, you know, before we were working in quite an unsel um, in quite a unconscious way or something, um, and then suddenly to be exposed to this huge amount of press and public interest in a project in an area that was kind of once forgotten and abandoned to now having like visitors coming from all over the world, like peering through letterboxes and stuff. I mean, it felt really uncomfortable for us. Um, so we wanted to try and find a way that we could take advantage of all the stuff that comes with the Turner Prize. So like massive publicity, like this kind of media whirlwind or whatever. Um, so we tried to drive it through this project. Um, so we thought, you know, we'll, we'll really work this business in. We'll get it so that at the opening of the Turner Prize, there's going to be a showroom for this new business. And then it can, like, sell all these products, and it'll make loads of money. <laughs> and then all the money can go back into the area. So it's like a social, social enterprise. So this is the corner shop, and this is the gang. Um, so we've got 12 people together who lived in the area. Um, and then after a kind of intensive period of development where we were going through, you know, using like offcuts to make bits of fabric, um, there's like terracotta, pressed terracotta stuff. So it's all, there's the kind of tiles of the decals. It's like blow torching. That's the, I'll just get them all going. Hey? Um, and I guess, you know, the idea is, is that it's quite, you know, we wanted to do something that's quite experimental in its production, where the goal was not making something that was perfect and consistent, but, you know, it kind of had this handmade element where there's kind of low barriers to entry um, in regards, you know, you don't have to be particularly skilled, it's just a kind of process, you know. So if you want to make this mantelpiece, you just have to churn up the concrete, throw it in, and hopefully the process will make something that's, that's kind of interesting. Um, so these are some of the products. I have to whiz through. So, I'm sorry. I've gone over. Um, uh, and then that launched. Um, oh, too many. <laughs> this launched at the Turner Prize. So this was our showroom at the Turner Prize. Um, so this was the exhibition show. It showed everything that had, that had been made, and everything was for sale. But it's for sale at prices which people can afford. So it's not art world. I mean, we're not in the art world. Um, we're, we're, selling, we're selling tiles for five pounds. That's, we're kind of like Wix is what we're going for. Um, um, so, you know, the intention of the workshop was really to try and continue and support this kind of creative DIY spirit that was already happening in the area. Um, these are just more photos. And so there's a shop, which if you go online, granbyworkshop.co.uk, you can have a look at these different products, buy different products. Um, and then, and then this other thing. And I guess, you know, just to sum up, it's really based on a belief that um, making things at kind of whatever scale, so whether it's like door handles, buildings, or like neighborhoods, can be a, a kind of empowering process um, and give a new way of seeing and understanding your surroundings so that things aren't necessarily fixed but are completely malleable and full of possibility. So if you want to change the world in which you live, you can just do it. You know, you can just do it. You can just plant the street. You know, that's 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 what that's that's it. It's over. <laughs> <laughs>